O Lord, you are a God of encouragement, and we need encouragement. Strengthen us this morning with your word. Use your spirit to grasp onto the truth spoken in our hearing today to build us up, to establish us, to hedge and bolden us, and to give us confidence in you and in in confidence in ways we have never seen before, Lord. We look to you now through your infallible word. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. This summer, me and my family had uh, the opportunity to spend some time in San Diego. Like many Phoenicians do, we drove to San Diego and spent some time there. We took a tour of the USS Midway. I'm sure some of you here have done the same. Uh, if you haven't, the USS Midway is that ship that's near downtown. It's off there in the, in the water, and it's just a big carrier ship there. It's docked there in the bay, and uh, we, we had the opportunity to tour it. And going to that, to that museum, touring it, you know, I walked on the ship, and I love my country. I, I have an appreciation for the military, as many of you do. But I was, I was filled with gratitude when I left that ship in a whole new way. Touring the USS Midway is one of those experiences that gives you a bigger view of the military. It gives you a greater appreciation for all the work and endurance it takes to keep us free. From the, the copious rooms we explored to those tiny little spaces assigned to each soldier, to the training rooms and the equipment and the logistics that kept that ship poised for duty. You know going into the ship it takes a lot of work. You know that. You recognize that. But when you see it, when you leave it, you see that ship and that process in an entirely new way. You see it with new eyes. You can't leave the ship with the same perspective you had when you boarded the ship. This morning, we're not going to take a tour of a ship. But each one of us did walk into this room with a perspective on salvation. For some of you, that perspective is right. For others, that perspective is wrong. Some of you have no perspective, and some of you are are wavering in your perspective. My hope this morning is that your perspective on salvation will change in in the same way that my perspective on the military changed when I stepped off of that ship there in San Diego. If you have a Bible, and I hope you do, please open it up to the letter of 1 Peter. This letter was written to Jewish and Gentile Christians, believers who were spread throughout the region of what we would call today Turkey. Peter probably wrote this letter from Rome sometime between 62 to 64 A.D., This was a perilous time, perilous time in the early church. The emperor Nero reigned and he sought to eradicate anyone that would not acknowledge him as divine. In the letter, after a brief introduction, Peter moves to encourage these dispersed saints with salvation realities. He says that they are born again to a living hope. They have a spiritual inheritance that is imperishable. And their faith is guarded, in fact, by the very power of God. Yet these saints are under the weight of persecution. Peter says in verse 7, they are grieved by various trials. In verses 10 through 12, which is going to be our text this morning, Peter desires to give these trial-laden saints an entirely new perspective on their salvation. Would you look down with me and let's read 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, in the, thi- in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. The 
thesis this morning, our propositional statement, the, the point of the message is captured in this sentence. In this passage, Peter demonstrates the grandeur of salvation as an encouragement to trial-laden saints, and as we'll see at the end, a grounds for obedient Christian living. Peter demonstrates the grandeur of our salvation first by expressing the mystery of the prophets in verse 10. Our text begins with this little phrase, concerning this salvation, or some of your versions might say, as to this salvation. As we are parachuting into this text, this phrase forms something like a title or a marker as to the topic at hand. Peter has in the previous verses spoken of this salvation, and he means to explain something more about this salvation in our verses. Peter expresses this mystery saying, the prophets searched and inquired carefully. Their investigation took in every point of view. They weighed all the options. Their inquiry indicates a search for something hidden. Their exploration was like a miner who digs deep down into the bowels of the earth in search of a precious metal. The investigation suggests that the the prophets were deeply interested in the things they proclaimed. We ought not to think that these prophets were emotionless vessels used by God as some mere tool. They were engaged, they were interested into the things they spoke. Who were these prophets? Your Bible uses the article there, the prophets. But the Greek text doesn't use the article. I believe the absence of the article here seems to to draw us away from specific prophets and seems to refer more to prophets in general. The role of this prophet was a proclaimer of divine revelation. He revealed God's will for the present He announced judgment and often predicted the future. In this way, the prophet did foretelling, and he did forthtelling. Maybe you've heard that before. Prophecy that involved future prediction is often called foretelling. And prophecy that was the present proclamation of or exhortation of God's word, that was called forthtelling. The prophet did both. Peter doesn't wish for us to think of any one prophet here, but rather to think of the prophets in general. We learn that the one called as a prophet was engaged not merely in foretelling and forthtelling, but was engaged also in the study of his own prophecies. He studied his own material. The prophets studied other prophets. They functioned as teachers and as students. They had to study because their words, their prophecies, weren't first their own words. These were God's words. We see this often when we see the, 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 the phrase, thus says the Lord. This wasn't the prophet speaking, this was God speaking through the prophet. Yet, in all these things he proclaimed, he understood them because they were from his mouth but he didn't understand the details of them. As to the time and circumstance, these things were beyond his grasp. Jesus affirms this prophetic, this prophetic inquiry in the Gospel of Luke. Maybe remember in Luke chapter 10, Jesus sends out the, the 72 to go to the Jews and proclaim to the Jews that the kingdom of God had come near, to proclaim that the Messiah, King Jesus, had come Luke 10, 24 says, For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Jesus affirms this this special thing that's happening with, with King Jesus there in their presence. The kingdom of God had indeed come near. The same interest each one of us has to look into the future, to know when and how the events of the future may unfold, was found in the prophets. This desire, I would imagine, would would only be enhanced if we were the ones speaking those prophecies. Daniel 9, chapters 1 and 2, or Daniel 9, verses 1 and 2, is a prime example of this, of this searching and inquiring carefully. You remember Daniel there is actually reading the prophet Jeremiah. He's studying the prophets. Daniel, who is himself a prophet. 
And he realizes in his study that the Babylonian captivity of the Jews is only going to be 70 years. And so he rejoices and he, he moves into prayer because he knows that the time of their captivity is drawing to a close. How does this inquiry, this mystery of the prophet, how does it come to be an encouragement to Peter's audience? How does it come to be an encouragement to us? How does the mystery of the prophets, or what does it have to do with the grandeur of salvation? I believe this, this, the answer to this question is really the backbone of this text. Peter wants his reader to understand where salvation as we know it, where this first century audience knew it, he wants this, them to understand where it fits into God's bigger plan, his plan of redemption. He wants his reader to view salvation as a crescendo, a, a climax, a high point, a crest. For millennia, man has, been, man has been searching for precious metals and gemstones. Emeralds were probably the most highly prized gemstone of antiquity. In Egypt, there is old mines where the Egyptians would search for emeralds. In 2004, a man named Terry Ledford found North Carolina's largest em emerald, titled the Carolina Emperor. Terry reached at what he said looked to be part of a 7-Up bottle in the dirt, and he pulled out, he unearthed a 310-carat emerald. In the history of the world, there has been an even more elusive jewel. In the same way a miner might follow a vein of quartz deep into the earth to unearth that priceless gemstone, the prophet would drill down deep into the word for a, just a glimpse of a precious stone. This precious, precious stone would break through at certain places of history. And it is in these areas, these veins of the gospel, so to speak, that run through history that the prophet longed to know more. Like Terry Ledford and his Carolina emperor, the prophet longed to put his hands on it. Unfortunately, the prophet could never quite get there. It was always just out of his reach. Peter wants us to know that in the days in which we live, the rubble has been removed, the strata has been softened, and the elusive jewel has been exposed. What the prophets knew about, what they were able to see from afar, yet what they longed to actually put their hands on has been dug up. And it has been dug up for you and me to behold. The trial-laden saints Peter is writing to needed to know this, and you and I need to know this. Notice the way Peter opens this letter. To those who are elect exiles of the dispersion, or some of your translations, to those who reside as aliens scattered. Notice verse 6. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary... You have been grieved by various trials. Peter is writing this letter to exiles, to aliens who have been dispersed, scattered abroad, and who are under persecution. Peter's readers needed to know that God is at work. God was at work. And in fact, their experience is very unique in history. Something had been revealed that caused a friction in the world that would marginalize them, that would lead to suffering, something that might even result in their death. But God had not abandoned them. Lest they think that God had left the building, in fact, God had just walked in the building. It was precisely because the details of salvation had been revealed that Christians were under attack. We need to know that God is at work. We need to know that our experience is unique in history. Something has been revealed that causes a friction in our world, that presses us into the margins of society. Don't fall into the trap of thinking 
that these trials, your experiences, the suffering that you're enduring is a result of God's absence. It is not. God was working in the trials of these first century Christians and he is working in your trials. Peter has demonstrated first the grandeur of salvation by expressing the mystery of the prophets and second, by explaining that mystery. What was the content of this mystery that the prophets sought out? Well, these prophets, they gazed into three things. The first thing they gazed into was grace. Peter uses the word in verse 10 there. The prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully. Now, grammatically, grace is not the object of the searching. But grace does describe that which the prophets proclaimed. The prophets foretold of grace. The prophets searched and inquired carefully into that which they predicted. Therefore, the prophets searched and inquired carefully into grace. What is grace? Some of you have remembered the definition of grace with the little acronym, God's Riches at Christ's Expense, G-R-A-C-E. Others have used the simple phrase, God's unmerited favor. Tozer said, grace is the good pleasure of God that inclines him to bestow benefits on the undeserving. The prophet did not speak about the grace that has come to us in a completely objective way. That is, God's grace was not entirely foreign to them. God's grace is found in abundance in the Old Testament. And most, if not all the prophets, did have experiential knowledge of that grace Early in the Bible, we read about Noah. Genesis chapter 6, verse 8 says, God, but Noah found favor, excuse me, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. The word favor is the word grace. Ezra says in Ezra 9, 8, that God has been gracious to Israel in delivering them from captivity. Proverbs 3, 4 says, God gives grace to the humble. Jeremiah, speaking of Israel's time in the wilderness, says they found grace in the wilderness. We can recall the times Israel disobeyed and they found grace through their leader and mediator, Moses. God's grace is clearly found in the Old Testament. And the prophet did indeed experience the grace of God. But in the New Testament, this grace is expanded. I I thought about about it this way. The Old Testament grace is, is kind of like a, a box that you see on a page, and uh, it's there, and it's in perspective, and you can see the sides. You know it's a box, and you can describe it as a box. But something happens in the New Testament. Something happens when grace is fully realized, and it's as if that box that was a two-dimensional object jumps off the page, and now we are holding in our hands this three-dimensional object. And we can put our hands around it. We can really feel it. We can interact with it fully. I think John is doing this a little bit in John chapter 1, verses 14 through 18. You're you're familiar with these verses. John speaks of Jesus and he says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as to the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. John is saying that the revelation of God's grace reaches its pinnacle with the coming of Jesus. Jesus is full of grace and truth. Truth. From him, the believer receives grace upon grace. Grace and truth come through him. And he is that which interprets, explains, or literally exegetes who God is and what God does. He, that is Jesus, has made him, that is God the Father, known. This grace is not God's common grace. God's common grace we all experience. It's that grace that restrains sin. It's the grace that God displays by caring for the earth such that sinful humanity might enjoy it. 
The grace that we're all experiencing here, those that don't know Christ, that sit in this room and breathe the air and sit in a soft, comfy chair, that have no blood on your face and are not dying, all of that is a grace of God. That is God's common grace now. Peter's not talking about that. Peter's talking about God's special grace. Special grace saves and sanctifies and brings to glory. What Peter uses the word grace, what Peter uses the word grace in verse 10, I believe, for, when he uses it, he has in mind the whole process of salvation. The salvation package, you might say. Titus 2.11 uses it that way, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. The word grace is a, is a blanket term used to refer to the totality of salvation. Calling, regeneration, faith and repentance, justification, adoption, sanctification, perseverance, union with Christ, glorification, are all imbibed with the grace of God. Not one of these salvation doctrines starts with us. All begin in the mind and will of God, with our involvement merely being as beneficiary. This is why we often capture all the doctrinal teaching on salvation with that moniker, the the doctrines of grace. It's a fitting title. And friends, don't miss the disjunctive clause here. That may be yours. Or that, excuse me, was to be yours. Peter is saying that the enigmatic features of salvation have been fully revealed to us. All of us who live post-Bethlehem, all those who live on this side of the cross, have access to the rich details of salvation. All those who live on this side of the cross have access to those details and have the privilege of of understanding. They're, They're made explicit to us. All of those details find their intersection at the person and work of the Messiah. The prophets could see a Messiah in the future, yes. But they could not see Jesus. They knew of a king, but they knew nothing of King Jesus. They knew of a suffering servant, but they knew not the name of Jesus. The prophets gazed into the grace of into this grace, and they also gazed into the sufferings of Christ. These are the sufferings that were directed towards or appointed for the Messiah. The word suffering is in the plural, and it reminds us of all that Jesus endured. His suffering was not merely rejection, false accusation, betrayal, mistreatment, scourging, mockery, dishonor, and death. His suffering, sufferings were all these things and much more. The sufferings of Christ are at the center of Christianity. At the center of our faith is a crucified Christ, a lamb slain. Would you turn in your Bible to Isaiah chapter 53? If there's any passage that captures what Peter is talking about, this would be one of them. Isaiah 53 is the keystone of the prophecies of the prophets. Some have called it the fifth gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Isaiah 53. The central focus in this chapter is the death and exaltation of Christ. Isaiah 53, look at verse 2. For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. There was nothing spectacular about Jesus' childhood. We know very little about Jesus' early life in his childhood. We know that he grew up off the beaten path in a little village town area entitled Nazareth. And this simple upbringing was particularly hard for those who expected a great Jewish king. This didn't fit what they thought, what they expected. And so we have verses 3 through 6. He was despised and rejected by men, 
a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and was esteemed him, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Notice the progression of terms in these verses. Despised. Rejected. Acquainted with grief. Stricken. Smitten. Afflicted. Pierced crushed, chastised, or chastisement, scourging, wounds. The the verse moves from a rejected Messiah to a crucified Messiah very quickly. The the language, particularly in verse 5, is very strong. In fact, the Hebrew language, the original language here, has no better way of commuting, no, no more intense way no more of graphic way of communicating a brutal and violent death. The, the, the words used are the strongest and most graphic expressions. Pierced through. This word in the original is used of the fatal wounding of a person. To be crushed speaks of grinding something down to dust, to literally pulverize it. Scourge is to have blows that cut deep into the flesh. These are the things that Peter calls the sufferings of Christ. And we would be remiss if we stopped there. Isaiah not only explains the violent death of the Messiah, he gives us the clearest picture of the substitutionary atonement found in Scripture. Notice the great exchange. Don't miss this. Verse 4, our griefs he bore. Our sorrows he carried. Verse 5, our transgressions he was pierced for. Our iniquities, that's a fancy word for sins, he was crushed for. His chastising brought us peace. His scourging or his wounds healed us. Having laid out this great exchange, he moves in Isaiah 53, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone, away, gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah here outlines the universality and individuality of our sin, of man's sin, and the universal scope of God's atonement. It's as if Isaiah paints this picture and it's, 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 it's the, the brutalist, most violent picture ever. It's the death of a savior. Uh, the perfect lamb slaughtered. And we stand gazing into it and in verse 6, it's as if the lighting in the room changes and where we could see the picture, now we just see our faces in the glare. And the focus moves from, from the death of Jesus to us. We have gone astray, each one of us, to his own way. Yet, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. In Matthew 11, verse 28, Jesus said, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If you have not come to Jesus this morning, if you have not believed, I want you to know that this great exchange can happen for you. You can exchange your grief for joy, your sorrows for rejoicing. You can find forgiveness of sins if you place your trust in this Messiah, this crucified Christ, this slain lamb, if you confess Jesus as Lord and believe that God, in fact, raised him from the dead. 
The gaze of the prophet does not stop there. Finally, we see that the prophet, the prophet gazed into what Peter says are the subsequent glories. You can move back now to 1 Peter. The subsequent glories. These sufferings came to us in the plural with many features, and the glories come to us also in the plural with many features. These glories might be associated with Jesus' resurrection, his ascension, his sitting at the right hand of the Father, his return and reign in glory, and his majestic glory as the judge of all. The prophet Daniel in Daniel 7, verses 13 through 14, gives us a good example of what Peter is talking about here. He says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him, that is, the Messiah, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should, should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. These are the subsequent glories. The prophet gazed at the Messiah and all he would do regarding his dominion, glory, and kingdom. It was, in fact, passages like these that so challenged the Jews, challenge them today. Isaiah 42 is another good example. There we, we learn about not the suffering servant, but the chosen king. Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 4 says this, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. A picture of a, a ruling king is painted. What proved so challenging for the prophet and the Jewish mind in general was bringing passages like Isaiah 42 and the chosen king, bringing them to, next to passages like Isaiah 53 with the suffering servant. Messiah is portrayed as both the chosen king and the suffering servant. Peter himself struggled with this. You remember in Matthew chapter 16, when Jesus is talking about his death. What does Peter do? He rebukes Jesus. Don't talk like that. And Peter has those, uh, Jesus has those famous words, Get behind me, Satan. Peter didn't understand that for Jesus to become that chosen king, he had to first become the suffering servant. Mark 9 is another one. There Jesus speaks of his death and it says, but they did not understand the saying. Those listening, the disciples, they didn't understand the things pertaining to Jesus' death. And it says they were afraid to ask him. The Jews just could not compute that their king would become the suffering servant. We live in a time in which certain events have happened, salvation events, and further revelation has been given in Scripture. We see the cross and have been given instructions about the kingdom that will be established at, on the earth at Jesus' second coming. The prophets simply were unable to put these things together. Outside of living in the time in which we live, these things have been revealed to us. At this point, we need to just step back a little bit in our text. 1 Peter chapter 1. Let me read where we're at again. Verse 11. Inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. What was it exactly about this grace and these sufferings of Christ and these subsequent glories, these glories that followed the cross, that the prophet desired to know. Verse 11 says that they were inquiring what person or time. Here we have the prophet's basic problem. There's a bit of a grammatical issue in this verse. 
with this phrase, what person or time. The, the problem relates to whether we translate the word what person, uh, uh, whether or not it modifies time or not. In the NASB, that's the New American Standard, and the ESV, which most of us are probably reading here, the translators have determined that what person does not modify time. So you have what person or time. You have two separate ideas. The implication of this view are that the implications are that the prophet inquired about the specifics of the Messiah, what person, what kind of person he was, and the specifics of his coming, what time would he come. In the second view, what person does not modify time, and so the translation is something like seeking to know what time and circumstance, or maybe time and situation. The NIV favors that translation. If you're reading from the NIV, you see that. It's actually the second view that nearly all the Greek grammarians and commentators favor. I think this one is probably closer to what the truth is. The implications here are that the prophets long to know the time and season or the situation around the Messiah. The first term raises the question of the precise date of the Messiah. And the second term speaks to the characteristic, characteristic, characteristic features of the time, the season of his appearing. You remember maybe in Mark chapter 13 in the Olivet Discourse when Jesus there is talking about the future judgment that's going to come both at, in, uh, with the Jews at the temple and then reaching forward into the future. And the, the disciples there ask a similar time, type of question. What time will these things happen? What will be the sign? What will be the situation? What will be the circumstance that these events actually come to fruition? Peter says these prophets sought to know what time or circumstance through the power of the Spirit of Christ. The source of the prophetic utterance was none other than the Spirit of Christ. These prophets were not speaking on their own accord, nor were they speaking by their, by their own power. Their prophecies were wrought from the Spirit of Christ. Peter draws this out a little more in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. He says, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And this Spirit of Christ is simply just another title for the Holy Spirit. There are not different spirits in the Godhead. Ephesians 4.4 4 says there is one Spirit. It may be because the Spirit was working in them to indicate the things pertaining to Christ that the title Spirit of Christ is used. Peter demonstrated to these trial-laden saints the grandeur of salvation by expressing the mystery of the prophets, by exploring that mystery, excuse me, explaining that mystery. The prophets gazed into grace. They gazed into the sufferings of Christ. They gazed into the subsequent glories. Finally, Peter exposes the ministry of the prophets. As it relates to this ministry, we learn that somehow it was revealed to them they were, that they were not, these prophets were not serving themselves. In this, pro, in this way, they were serving future generations. They were serving all those who live this side of the cross. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you. In the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. The service to the reader in Peter's day and to us does not mean the prophet did not benefit from his prophecies. Certainly they did benefit, for, benefit by looking forward to their coming king. But there was mystery in the details. They expressed faith in their God. One commentator said it this way. They spread, out, they spread out the table so that others might afterward feed on the food laid out. It is the ministry of the prophets that sets the table, that fashions the backdrop, that lays the foundation for those who would come next and announce to you the good news. Consider again the, the references we have used, Isaiah 42 of the, the chosen king and Isaiah 53 of the suffering servant. 
Isaiah 42 is a passage about the Lord's chosen servant who has come to establish justice on the earth. Isaiah 53 is a passage about the Lord's suffering servant who has come to purchase his people. The events and revelation given to us now provide the needed details that put that puzzle together. Isaiah 53 before Calvary is a a passage about a coming servant who will die for many. After Calvary, Isaiah 53 is a further description of the sufferings of Jesus. They are descriptions of actual events prophesied some 650 years before they happened. Jesus is that suffering servant. They describe in detail and provide amazing evidence for the validity of Scripture and the sovereign plan of redemption. Isaiah 42 before Calvary is a passage about a coming king that would gather both Israel and the nations under his rulership. After Calvary, Isaiah 42 is a passage about King Jesus who will return to the earth for a thousand-year reign to fulfill all of his promises to Israel before he crushes Satan and makes a new heaven and earth. The prophets prepared the clay, but it was Jesus and the New Testament apostles and prophets that formed that that clay. They placed it in the kiln and they fired it. The prophets prepared the soil and sowed the seeds. Jesus and the New Testament apostles and prophets watered the soil and pruned the vine. One commentator said, while our modern critical scholars customarily look for that which is new and unique in the Christian message, it is significant that the earliest Christians authenticated their message by declaring Jesus to be the fulfillment of that which was old. What was proclaimed and explained and laid out in the past comes to the present to us. Peter says, through those who preached the good news to you. Peter is general here. He may or may not have in mind himself. The general nature of his comment leads us to think that he means anyone who preaches the good news. For it is when any person proclaims the truth of Christ that he is in some way benefiting and leaning on the ministry of the prophets. The good news is simply the gospel. This is the message explained from Isaiah 53 earlier. The good news is that God has provided a way for sinful people to be in his presence. The good news is that Jesus paid our ransom. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him that is in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. He becomes sin. He takes our sin. And we become righteous. We take his righteousness. This is the good news that Peter speaks of. And this news, this is not a worldly message. The message was preached by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. This good news is a message that was formed in the past and brought into the the present through the work of the Holy Spirit. It is not something that began in this world, but it is a message from a transcendent place. It is not a message that was drawn up in the minds of men, but was drawn up in the mind of God. The gospel does not use the logic of this world, but the logic of the God who created this world. The effects of this message affect not only this life, but the effects extend into the future, into after death, after life, and go forever and ever. The gospel has a meaning above us. Its full realities cannot be fully comprehended and will themselves be the subject matter by which we will gaze forever into in the next life. You recall Revelation chapter 5. In that passage, the The curtain is drawn back and we're given a glimpse into heaven. We read there the words of heavenly beings surrounding the throne of God. What is on their lips? Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. And by your blood you ransom people for God. The subject matter of heaven being beyond our ability to fully comprehend is a crucified Christ 
While it is true there is no death in heaven, it is also true that death will never leave our minds in heaven. It will be the center of our praise. The death of the one who died for us and through whom we are granted access to that heavenly realm. In fact, the very presence of God. Peter closes off this section with this phrase, things into which angels long to look. Here we have the capstone of the grandeur of salvation. Peter is directing our thoughts to the heavenly place of which we just spoke of in Revelation chapter 5. Peter says the angels long to look. The verb to long here denotes a strong interest or craving. Used in the present tense, the idea is one of continued inner yearning. And a yearning to comprehend, to know. It says, Peter says, these angels long to look. Literally, to bend over or to bend forward to examine something more closely. You just can't get the the picture out of your head of angels in heaven just reaching over and looking to, to see the plan of redemption unfold. And they're doing this continually, intentionally. We don't speak much about angels in our preaching, and I'll save you from a detailed angelology, but... Uh, angels are created beings, we know that. Uh, they're created to praise the Lord. Each angel was directly and individually created by God. There is no kingship among angel- angels. There's no bond or connection that ties one to the next. Uh, there's no cohabitation, there's no offspring. Angels were not created as a kind or a race, but more of, as a company. And because angels were created as a company, they they have no savior. If theoretically they were to be saved, each angel would need his own sin bearer. We read last week in the service, Hebrews chapter 2, in which the author of Hebrews says that God will not do this. God has not provided redemption for the angels. He has put forth a plan to provide atonement, however, for the human race. Angels have intellect, they have emotion, they have will. They stand in awe of Christ and his work of redemption. It stands to reason that since angels were created to worship God, they would long to look into that thing which most brings him glory. The the redemption of his people. It is the heavenly view that Peter uses to turn our focus from the grandeur of salvation to the second part of our thesis statement, to obedient Christian living in the verses that follow our text. You remember we said at the outset here, and I'm closing with this, Peter demonstrates the grandeur of salvation as an encouragement to trial-laden saints and as a grounds for obedient Christian living. The first part of that statement points back up to the the verses that preceded. Peter's, this is placed in our text to provide an encouragement for these folks, these people that have been spread abroad. They're dispersed, they're aliens, and they're they're feeling the weight of these trials. And so he's giving them encouragement. He's opening up, he's pulling the curtain back, and they're able to see this amazing reality of salvation that's theirs right now in this time, in this moment. These things that they're suffering under are the things that angels in spiritual realms that we can't even fathom are longing to look into. And then he turns. And this becomes something more than an encouragement, but it becomes a grounds for obedient Christian living. And if we were continuing our study in 1 Peter, we would would unpack that. But, 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 But he gives us four commands And I'll just read them for you so you can see. It's important there in verse 13. He says, therefore, because of that, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He continues in verse 2, verse 15. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. He continues in verse 22. 
having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly. And then in chapter 2, verse 1, so put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. The command comes in verse 2. Like newborn infants, long for the pure milk of the word. Friends, I, I hope that this passage comes to you as an encouragement. And I hope that you indeed have tasted that the Lord is good. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, you have indeed brought us encouragement through your word. We are in awe of your perfect plan, the one that you have set in motion. And to recognize that that plan included sending your son to die for sinners like us is beyond our grasp. Thank you for the prophet who spoke, for the apostle who taught, for the angels that wonder. Help us to wonder at the grandeur of salvation as an encouragement in times of trial, as a grounds for obedient Christian living. May we live in the present day with full recognition of the past. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.